I'm Andrew Trendle. You're watching NME, and we're here today with Yanis Filipakis. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll keep this in. Like, I don't just, know why we'll do like behind the scenes. This is like the fifth intro we've done. But to be fair, in our interviews that we do with you, it is always better. You know, the funny shit's always off camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's why we're going to keep this to keep in it. this time. Yeah. Are we actually doing this? <laughs> okay, cool, right. Hey, man. Oh, we do, are we doing it? Right, yeah, 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 we're doing it. Yeah, we can like... You know, we do, do one at the end, do we? Yeah, yeah, we'll then. do some CGI stuff too. Um, so, Yanis, where are we? Uh, we're in 13 studios in West London. Um, so we're here to hang out. Um, this is like Damon's studio, Damon Alban's studio, and um, he did a bunch of the recordings with Tony here for The Good, Bad and The Queen, and Tony lived upstairs for periods of time and would come and record here, so like, when kind of, definitely not my spiritual home, but more like um, Tony Allen's, I guess, like, spiritual home in London. When he would be in London, he'd be in here, so it seemed fitting to hang out with you here, and we were going to play some of the record and stuff in a bit. Nice. Do you um, bump into Damon by the kettle? Uh, no, no, I don't. I bumped into Damon a couple of times. Um, that's a story for another day, I think. Yeah. But we're here to announce, finally, Yanis and the yaw. For those who aren't aware, a yaw is the twisting or oscillation of a moving ship or aircraft about a vertical axis. Part no. Um, <laughs> so we're finally announcing uh, this record that you started with Tony Allen quite a while ago. It feels like we've been talking about this for years, man. Yeah, um, it does, doesn't it? How does it feel to... Well, we have, literally have. Yeah. Uh, how does it feel to kind of finally have it at this stage of completion? Good. I feel I feel unburdened now. I feel like um, it's something... There's been like this kind of unfinished business that's been occupying my like vision for the future. And it was like I had to kind of finish it and especially... Um, after Tony passed away and like in the midst of COVID, it became kind of much more of a serious project to try and like make sure we, we did it, you know, did it justice. So um, it feels good. And I just want like people to hear it and for it to be out and um, yeah, just to kind of uh, release it into the world will be, be a great like uh, relief in a way for yeah. me. Well, take us back to kind of the very, very genesis of it. So my understanding is that when you and all the Foles lads shared a house, you would like, put some like slamming fellow cootie on an evening yeah. to get you guys going. Yeah, as you do, you know, and like, um, yeah, we'd, we'd listen to a bunch of like old Afrobeat records. In fact, that like the record we played more than any other was a compiled like Tony Allen best of um, that had like progress, Afro disco beat, all like his classic tracks from over the years. And that record got absolutely hammered. It got worn out. Um, so like fast forward a few years later, um, somebody we knew in common um, who was basically trying to get, you know, Tony to collab with more people and different people, you know, um, un maybe unexpected collaborations, called me and said, um, do you want to go over to Paris to write some tracks for Tony? And I was like, I jumped at the opportunity, um, but it was down the line. We were on tour. We were like some somewhere in Europe, I think. Um, and then time passed. The tour took its toll. I came back kind of knackered and then I almost didn't go. I was just kind of wow. like, um, I was just pretty like broken by the end of the tour. And the, the idea of like schlepping the guitar and going to Paris for a session was just kind of, um... but anyway, I was encouraged to go and then I, I went and it, and it kind of, you know, the, it kind of changed my life. Like it was, a, it was one of the best musical experiences of my life. So um, yeah, it was definitely good that um, I got a, the nudge that I needed to. So I went to Paris and then, um, that's when we first met. Okay, so you walk into the room, Tony Allen sat there, what's he like? So I get to Paris and I took my bead on the train and stuff and I walked through a little bit n nerdily and nervously into this studio that where everyone was smoking obviously because it's France. Um, it was a big basement studio, kind of it's very 70s, kind of naff, um, but full of amazing instruments and it had like lots of airs. Um, since in there, there was a bunch of different like West African percussion um, and Tony was just sort of sitting there in a fog of smoke, to be honest. And um, I don't think that the whiskey bottles had been opened yet, but they were in proximity. <laughs> he wasn't like, you know, super, I think it was kind of early. He wasn't like super friendly um, <laughs> straight away. Um, but like, so there was some producers and collaborators. He, he, he had been writing with these French um, guys, the Vincents, they should be called, because there's two of them, both called Vincent. Um, they're kind of the Frenchest men in the world. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so they were like, they kind of set me up and then we, we, ch we chatted a little bit, me and Tony, but, but really like we got in the room um, straight away and then we just, I pulled out um, 
uh, the riff that is Walk Through Fire, and I just started playing that. And then he came in into his into like into the room, into like his drum area, and then um, just started playing. And it was just kind of crazy. Like <laughs> I felt like I was lifting off slightly. Um, and we just we just jammed it, and then by the end of that day, we had kind of cut the majority of the th uh, the first three tracks on the EP. I went back the next morning. We did a couple of like quick structural things, um, did some hand claps all together, and then uh, yeah, and then that was kind of it. You know, um, that was it was sort of set in motion. We were we, I think we just kind of had be we became friends just through that through, <coughs> through through that jam that initial jam it was just felt like the whole room warmed up yeah um yeah well that's it how I many at what point did it feel like he kind of broke the walls down where tony stopped being frosty and was like oh, uh, we're friends <laughs> that was a, i've never heard him speak I'm after sure. that jam i think we basically just came out and then he was just kind of like okay this guy's kind of all right you know rather than just some random dude that's walked in off the street or something um but yeah it just felt like the music connected us Mm. Um, especially like once I started singing, I think he might not have, he didn't expect me to sing the way that, you know, maybe it was just unexpected to him. Um, I really don't think he was even that familiar with who I was, you know, when I went in or like, and really, I think somebody just said like, you should just try this out. And Tony was collaborating with lots of people in Paris. So once that happened, we had like, um, Rain Can't Reach Us and um, Walk Through Fire those once those first two tracks had been played i think then then we were just you know we were sharing spliff and um drinking whiskey and getting on yeah well how would you describe how you landed on that kind of the sonic dna of this ep because you know you obviously you don't want to do foals with me oh, foals with like <coughs> a different flavor you know and he, you don't just want to do like tony allen featuring yanis i mean how did you land on the kind of the sonic palette of this i mean we didn't really have any pre like pre destined idea for it so the first riff was just one that i thought would be cool to play i mean i didn't even <clears throat> intend it as a as a track really it was just meant to be like a kind of jam um so we we just guided it through through intuition just like just we just followed the creative impulse um and i think by the nature of like the the mix of the influence between tony and i it was bound to be something slightly other you mm. know um there's obviously aspects of what people might identify as like a false sounding riff and because obviously like it's me playing guitar um one of the tracks actually was like a loop that was um written in the same era as um some of the everything not saved stuff and then just didn't make it into the room with the boys so i had it and i was like oh this would be great to work with tony so there are some similar dna um strands with like false tracks and obviously tony's style of drumming is inimitable like you know it's tony allen in, in, on the drums um but i think that <clears throat> by virtue of the by virtue of the collab it's just kind of it's something slightly other you know yeah did jack get jealous uh <laughs> <laughs> i don't know but uh, tony's like his favorite you know one of his favorite drummers so mm. he was always super super um uh, positive about it. I think that you know maybe he wished like it could have been like a you know something with all of us or something or maybe you know we could have all played together as well. It could have been cool. Yeah. Um, I did it. We did one live kind of uh, improv gig. Tony and I and Jimmy joined in for that. It was like a milk thing, and we did it in Paris. And Tony came on for bits of that. So that hope you know we were hoping that we'd do more live together. But yeah. alas, yeah, yeah. But um, I remember talking to you once, and it was during. Uh, one of the many, many, many French strikes, and you said you were walking around and there was like trash piled high in the streets and shit was on fire. Yeah. Um, obviously, a lot of what Tony's done is quite socially minded. I mean, how did you approach the lyrics to this record and kind of bake in that kind of French defiance to it? Yeah, I mean, that's that, that I just needed to not write the, the, the lyrics from like the same perspective as I would probably write more um, intimate Foles tracks. So I wanted it to be more protest driven or at least in the in the language that that Tony and I shared was like him encouraging me to write lyrics that were more um socially engaged and like you're saying like we were it was you couldn't shy away from it there was literally like mice peeking out of you from garbage like piles on the way to the studio and stuff so um I think that that sense of like combat and social decay um which is which is the lives that we're living in in many ways it's like that is just that permeates the record and it was something that instead of like at, you know i tony just encouraged me not to shy away from it you know and i think by virtue of it being a collaboration between the two of us i'm i probably felt um 
empowered to write a certain type of lyric that perhaps within Foles wouldn't feel quite right for whatever mm. reason, you know? So it's a bit more, um, it, it has that kind of Parisian protest spirit to it, a lot of the tracks do anyway. Yeah, I mean, what do you think the EP tells us as a result of that? Is it just a portrait of the time or? Um, I think that it should, it should have a kind of galvanizing, um, there should be a feeling of gal galvanization in it, that, that <clears throat> all isn't lost, you know? And that, um, that, you know, you can create beauty around and outside of the fire, outside of things being on fire. Um, and that the record, if anything, to me is soundtracking like this feeling of precipice. Um, so it, it, it doesn't impart like a specific message other than that, that to me it's the soundtrack for, for the protest, you know? Yeah. So that, that was the kind of way I was thinking about it. It's, it isn't didactic in any way, like, you know, that's not really my style, so. Yeah. And then fast forward to 2020, sadly we lose Tony. Yeah. How did that kind of impact your relationship to the songs? Um, so what, what happened is like we, we, we had done a couple of other extra sessions afterwards. Um, then I would stay on in the studio and like Tony would leave some days. Um, and then I started working on some of everything not saved in the same studio with the same guys. Mm. So there was a kind of crossover. And then, um, and then COVID struck. So we kind of obviously lost all momentum and it just became something that was slightly in the back burner mm. um, that probably quite easily could have dissolved, you know, into the ether, but then I think, you know, we'd, we'd had plans to try to, to pick stuff up again after, after COVID, but then obviously I was just hit with this news that he passed away and it was quite sudden, nobody expected it. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he, was, he, wa he wasn't young, but he was healthy, you know, in a, and he was strong and uh, I think it just shocked everyone. So I got the news through, through the Vincents um, and I think the moment that, um, in a way that that news had set in after like just feeling grief and then putting a bunch of his records on that evening in the next couple of days and stuff um it just it just it just became clear to me that we like just had to finish it mm. because i just think that there was something um there was something crushing about n not having completed it you know while he was while he was alive and it was so close to completion that i just felt like it needed doing justice you know just to just to finish it off and get it out and show people what a cool thing that we had made yeah. you know it should just be done right you know for, yeah. in his memory and like and out of respect to the what was a chance encounter with him in a way where we met in a studio he didn't really know who i was he didn't really give a fuck we smoked some hash together and then we wrote some wicked tunes and we became kind of i feel like you know i'm not like a hit you know it sounds a bit hippie but it's like our spirits got on you know yeah. it's like something larger than just like how you know the realities of our life we wouldn't exchange stories there were there were lots of things where we did that we didn't have in common yeah. but what we had in common was a kind of a shared language that was separate from your everyday experience of making a friend you know and and um that's why it's such a um a special experience for me in my life so what can you tell us about how you kind of overcame that challenge of wanting to finish this but kind of keep it imbued with the spirit of tony and sort of mm. Did you hear like Tony's voice in the studio? We're like, turn that up, turn that down, play that faster. Have, but thanks, have a smoke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, like the the uh, the Vincents had worked with him a bunch on other projects, so could they could almost be, you know, they would say like Tony wouldn't have wanted that part louder. He wanted his kick drum sounding exactly like this, mm. his snare sounding exactly like this. So they guided a lot of that principle. But also a lot of the tracks were so finished, essentially, the only bits that needed completing were some of mine. Mm. Um, so then I didn't really, we didn't actually mess, um, mess with that much of the original tracking. Like it, most of the tracks are literally cut from a jam done twice. They weren't replayed, there weren't multiple takes. We didn't make this EP like a record, like an album mm. where there was a defined destination and there was an idea of like perfection that we were striving for. It was, it was liberated in the sense that we were just like, we're just gonna jam twice and then cool, let's make something out of it. And it, it was very rough and ready and very fast. And once, once like the, the instrumentals had been captured, they weren't really tinkered with much at all. So there's only, there's one track under the strikes where we had to do some actual drum editing and stuff um, and, and general structuring on that, um, like after Tony had passed, but, um, but everything else was set 
at least with you know most of his stuff. So there was a kind of feeling. That's partly why there was such a such a feeling of like near completion that, yeah. that it just needed. It, we just needed to dot the dot the i's and cross the t's and stuff. So. And then when it was done, we how did it feel to kind of have this finished document? I mean, did you feel like you had a record that Foles would have partied to back in the house back in two thousand eight? Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, it's to some extent. Um, like me doing karaoke over one of so, well, at least some of it like felt like um, a kind of like me being invited into a Tony track and then getting yeah. to do like karaoke over it. Um, I felt like I had you know that that, that we made something precious and that's like rare. It's one of his final recordings. It's like it's a collaboration that can never exist at any other time. It will never be recreated. The combination through generations and through cultures of me being born in 1986, Tony being 70 something when we started recording. Yeah. Um, from Lagos, obviously with an incredible life story, him being based in Paris, like all of these cultural and generational components, um, experiences that we brought in um, and looking at life through two different lenses that this, this came out. Um, just feels like it's a treasure to well, me. That's it. I mean, this isn't a tourism thing either. So your mum's South African, right? So you've had this music in your life, like for as yeah. long as you can remember. Yeah, I have. I mean, I came to Fela Kuti a bit later, but definitely like a lot of um, Soweto, Soweto music, South African music I grew up with. So, which is partly why I play guitar. You know, I took more inspiration, to be honest, from records my mum was playing um, and guitar styles from those records growing up than I ever did from like Jimmy Page or any kind of rock rock guitarist yeah. that's not really my um lineage like you know you can ask the guys in the band and people that know me like i you know i play the guitar like in a kind of um very crude um way where it's not schooled in like the canon of rock music from you know from the uk or wherever else like for me the 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 the, the sound that I chase with the guitar is one that comes much more from a from an African place, whether that's from Mali or from South Africa or from Nigeria. It's like there's a shared style of guitar playing that is the one, that's the one that gets me out of my seat, yeah. you know? Well, what can you tell us about the concept of the yaw and what you're launching here? What happens next? Um, I, I don't, I don't have the answer to that, and that that in itself excites me. Mm. You know, like I just wanted to put this record out. To me, the the yaw is a kind of collaborative orbit that can exist going forward, and that's kind of why I like the the this idea of it being on an axis that spins. It's like members can rotate. Future collaborations could occur if that happens, but also. Um, it doesn't need to, and there's no pressure on it. I, I want this to be something that is fluid and solely driven by, like, by freedom and creativity, and not by any kind of um, concerns yeah. in a way. You know, so the yaw is just kind of an open parachute, and we'll just see when it when it gets deployed. Yeah. So you could meet Damon by the kettle this afternoon, or we could be waiting twelve years. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Anyone on your Bucket list to pull into the yours orbit. Your bit. There you go. Into the your bit. I like that. <laughs> I've been talking to a Malian guitarist called um, Gim Gimba, who's in Paris, um, who also knows the Vincents. So I might do some sessions um, with him. Um, I've got some like old recordings with Carl Hyde from Underworld, and I feel like we it'd be cool to revisit yeah. those and maybe do um, do some collaborations there. Um, but I'm not sure, really. I think I think it would be cool just to keep it open ended. But um, yeah, and maybe some even some Greek musicians. Um, but like, <clears throat> I like the idea that the, the yaw would be like a like um, it would be a culturally diverse um, project, you know. So that, that it's it's not um, it's not it's staying in one place for too long. Mm. What can you tell us about the aesthetic of the record, the artwork, the visuals, the videos? What, 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 what are we going to see? Oh, um, well, the, the artwork um, is just some paintings made by a British um, artist called Barker, who's re really cool. Um, I absolutely love his stuff. He, I, I kind of came across it through, he did some artwork for Yusuf Days. Um, so it's super colourful. Obviously, like this, this record is called um, Lagos Paris London. You know, it's like meant to be. Uh, postcards from these respective 
places in a way. So the artwork reflects that. They're kind of like um, collage, postcard figments of these places. And I mean, I guess also to answer one thing about the you're like maybe the next one will be like, you know, Berlin, a Athens, Ooh. Burundi or something yeah. like have, have these triangular locations and then um, see how the records come about. But um, so this record was done by Barker. It's illustrative. Um, he did some amazing artwork for us. The videos we're just discussing um, about how that's going to work. But um, yeah, we'll see. It's kind of some of this stuff is to be figured out, I think. Yeah. And there are live shows on the way too, right? Yeah, there's some live shows. Um, I'm not sure what is like definitely confirmed, but there will be like some live um, performances of the of the music. Um, you, you know, and probably the band will be made up of the collaborators who who worked on the record and then some players that used to play with Tony or um, are from that like lineage maybe in some way. But um, yeah, definitely get, gonna get the Vincents on stage and some other players that played with Tony from largely from Paris. Yeah, is that just gonna be the EP and some extended jam? Yeah, or? probably, yeah. yeah. Chucking yeah. an ABBA cover for it, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, no, it, it'll be cool, like it'll be the EP and then there'll probably be like maybe some other material that was like floating around at the time or stuff from those Milk Nights that we did and um, yeah, it'll, it'll have quite a wild and free improvised spirit to, to it, I think. It's going to be like a, a jam. Yeah. And this is very much a kind of collective idea. This, this isn't like the launch of Yanis, the solo artist. Yeah, no, not at all. And like, because this, in a, you know, this isn't actually like, if I was to do a solo record, it wouldn't probably be this, you know. This is definitely meant to be an, a, an archival um presentation of an, an amazing document an amazing treasure that happened it happened you know it started quite a few years ago the sessions with tony so um i very much believe in it i want it to be out now in 2024 but it's not necessarily like the creative move if i was to re record something from scratch right now it wouldn't it wouldn't by nature of it not being with tony wouldn't be that right mm. now so this is definitely meant to be um, a homage and a, and a release of this project that happened with Tony Allen. It's not like the Yanis Philippakis experience. <laughs> well, I think the last time we spoke was just before uh, Confessions, the musical, which you uh, yeah. wrote, wrote the score for. I mean, yeah, where we hung out with the Schwim. The Schwim, this is what I was going to say. Are you getting a taste for that, the theatre world for after parties with David Schwimmer? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's been coming to false shows for years. Has he? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, so I see. Well, a few years. But. Um, yeah, am I, so what's the question? Am I liking Gleanies <laughs> and shit at the National Theatre? Yeah, have you got a taste for that kind of world? Not really. I mean, I like <laughs> I like the creative world of it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I like I like having. Um, I want to have like a hydra-headed creative output. I want to be able to to just be expressive and creative and and be productive and um, be in different disciplines and like being in. Um, the theatre world, it's not, it's not necessarily even the theatre world, it could be the film world, or, but like being in a, in a world where the music has this kind of supporting role is a really interesting one to be in, where it's not like, it, it's, it's, it's just as creatively challenging, it's just as musically inspiring to me, but it, but it lives in this kind of other shape that isn't to do with being in a band and playing on stage and um, it being to do with my identity, I like the fact that you can write music that is um, discreet and is much more based on how it interacts with actors or a stage and, yeah. and all that. that. I'm into that idea. Have you got anything else in the works at the moment? I'm doing another one, Ooh. another one, yeah. I'll see. Anything yeah. you can tell us about that? Yeah, it's, um, it's based on Antigone. It's by the same director, Alexander Zeldin. He, it's going to be on at the National um, next year. And it's got Tobias Menzies in it and Emma Darcy and Emma Mackey. And um, it is set in present day Britain, um, steeped in the housing crisis and in the tragedy of our time. And it's going to be intense and dark and heavy. Um, and it's going to be cathartic. And I'm just starting the music for it now. So, And the Schwim will be there. The Schwim will be there. <laughs> is he the most famous Foles fan? Um... <laughs> I'm not sure, actually. We sh I'm not sure. Who's he up against? Um, <laughs> I don't know, probably one of the royal family or something. <laughs> and um, how are the rest of it? Is Jimmy still working on his um, Cosmonaut concept album? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. You'd have to check in with him. I mean, he's, he, he is the Cosmonaut, so <laughs> it's hard to um, uh, hear what he's up to. I spoke to him the other day. He's been, like, moving house, so he, he is definitely writing some stuff, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping the thing with Jimmy's stuff is it's so good. I kind of always want to just use it for 
kind of harvest it for Foles selfish. Records. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Has there been much progress on the follow-up to Life Is Yours? I mean, it's, it sounds quite absolutely self none. selfish question given how much shit you've got going on. Yeah, absolutely nothing. Yeah, which is fine. I think you know we only we we just finished touring it in like Chris in January. We we did an Australian tour and stuff, um, and I think before we make another Folds record, we really want to have some time at home and apart and like to individually just kind of get replenished and be inspired and not not make one you know out of a sort of knee-jerk sense of obligation or because we don't have anything else to do it's like oh let's make a false right you know it's like i think we, we want to make the next record we want it to be really special um and i think that um you know we've been we've been busy with it so i think it's good to go out and like you know smell the roses for a bit and then come back in and then i think we'll make something really special yeah do you think having walter back is going to make for a meaty record meaty yeah um yeah i think it's going to be i mean it's fucking great he's back and i think that uh it will feel great in the room when we're writing together um and it will probably affect the writing somehow um i think it could be the best falls record yet um because i think uh, this space that we're going to now have over the next year and stuff is going to be crucial. And then, um, yeah, I think the only thing we kind of know is that it won't be like life is yours, you know, as is the Foles way. I'm pretty sure we're going to go and subvert and get into something new, some new interesting place. And, um, yeah, but having Wally back is going to be great, you know. No desire to get a house together again? I mean, we might make the record in one big house, I think, but, um, no. Who's that? Uh, just make a fly on the wall dog, like Big Brother style. I'd, I'd watch that. Who's the worst person to live with? Um, who's the worst person to live with? Probably, I mean, maybe me. Maybe me. Back in the day, not anymore. But I mean, I was smoking like 40 cigarettes a day. Um, the music was just relentless, sort of teasing people, probably not cleaning up that much. Um, yeah, just all of us were pretty gross back then when you look back at it. It's just like, it was just super, it was festy. Was Jack like cooking for everyone or just himself? Jack occasionally cooked for us, but he was in his kind of fledgling days of being a chef. Um, so there's this one dish that he would make um, every few months that we did enjoy, but in between that, there wouldn't be that much cooking, but there was a lot of just like, uh, yeah, it was just, it was just a fucking tip, basically. <laughs> well, just like chilling out, watching Hollyoaks. <laughs> what, what was it like in that house? Yeah. <laughs> so basically we had a, I mean, we had a basement um, we went down there, we soundproofed, we got these like dodgy guys to soundproof it. One of them died doing an armed burglary a few years Whoa. later in the centre of Oxford. He, he expired in the, in the centre of Oxford trying to rob a jeweller's. Um, I knew that they were dodgy guys at the time, but um, they, they gave us a good rate, so it seemed fair enough. Um, but yeah, we soundproofed this basement and then there would be three different bands rehearsing in there at all times. Um, we were mainly writing tunes to keep the put carpet be Beatles moving upstairs. <laughs> and the lady of the band. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Um, yeah, it was great. It was fucking great. No one really cooked. The fridge was in the middle of the kitchen floor for some bizarre reason. We drank a lot of whiskey. We were watching Mad Men at the time, um, which obviously you can hear in all the records. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was just, it was, it was a fucking, it was a good time. It yeah. was a really good time. I mean, we lived in a few houses. It wasn't just one. Like we lived in three. There was, the, there was a Holy Fire house, a Top Life Forever house and the Antidote's house, which was short lived in Brighton. Um, we went there, we put mounds of salt all over the carpets where the red wine had been spilt and then we promptly moved out. There's gonna be some fun scenes in the Foles movie, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, you, well, yeah, I think that it will be good and we can get the swim in it. <laughs> is, it is he playing you? I mean, of course. <laughs> Nice one. Yeah. Yanis, thanks nice. so much for your time, man. Thank you. Thank you.